Good evening, and thank you for joining us for Glaucomatous Visual Field Loss Not Due to Glaucoma, hosted by Dr. Sherry Bass. Dr. Sherry Bass is a distinguished teaching professor at the SUNY State College of Optometry, where she has served on the faculty for 40 years. She is also a diplomat of the American Board of Optometry and a fellow of the College of Optometrists in Vision Development. Dr. Bass is an attending in the retina clinic of the University Eye Center at SUNY State College of Optometry, where she is actively involved in clinical teaching and patient care of patients with retinal diseases and glaucoma. Dr. Bass has also authored over 150 publications, including several book chapters, and has presented over 500 lectures, both national and international meetings on diseases of the posterior segment imaging technology and perimetry. I'd love to welcome you to Dr. Sherry Bass, but first we need to go over a few housekeeping rules. So the Zoom functionalities, please refrain from using the chat function. I ask that you use the Q&A section for your questions. We're happy to answer those questions. As soon as something pops in your mind, feel free to go ahead and put that in the Q&A. We will answer the questions at the end. For further resources, please look to your chat box. For Perimetry Focus Month registration, we have a whole month of um, presentations planned, events planned in the month of March and welcome you to register for those items. Additionally, we'll have the e-learning module for the Visual Field Digest, as well as the PDF available in your chat functions as well. Now we're gonna go ahead and get to the pre-recording with Dr. Sherry Bass. And again, we thank you all for joining us this evening. Take it away, Dr. Bass. My name is Dr. Sherry Bass, and it is a pleasure for me to be part of this uh, Perimetry Focus Month with Hogstrite and to be able to lecture on a topic that has always been of great interest for me, and that is glaucomatous type field loss that is not due to glaucoma. I do not have any financial disclosures to report and yes, we all have glaucoma on the brain. We see lots of glaucoma. We're always afraid of not diagnosing glaucoma because we know that undiagnosed glaucoma can lead to progressive vision loss. However, not every visual field defect that looks like glaucoma is in fact due to glaucoma or worsening glaucoma. If you misdiagnose glaucoma, you could miss other sight-threatening and even life-threatening disorders, and you could be affecting treatment of your patient, either over-treating or not treating enough. So let's start out by just quickly reviewing the types of visual field defects that we do see in glaucoma, starting from early to end-stage glaucoma. We start out with paracentral defects. Then glaucoma progresses to cause nasal step defects, then arcuate defects. It progresses to altitudinal defects, and then finally peripheral field constriction and eventual, eventually visual acuity loss. So I will be going over cases of almost all of these types of defects to show what other diseases need to be considered when you do see a patient who you deem may be a glaucoma suspect that has a field defect that suggests that they may have glaucoma. So starting out in very, very early glaucoma, we see that the, that the shorter axons are affected near fixation, and that causes what we see as paracentral field loss. That's why these early central fields are important in patients that are early glaucoma suspects. The defects that we see are arcuate in shape and they are above or below the papillomacular bundle and we would expect them to be in the nasal field closest to fixation. Here, is a, here are the fields from a patient who is a very early glaucoma suspect, very little cupping, but high pressures. On the 10-2 of the Humphrey, all we see here is a paracentral probability point uh, with a deviation, but it's just one point. And these points are two degrees from fixation. So on the 10-2, the, the field points are two degrees apart. However, you measure the same patient on the M-top 
And in the central four degrees, the points are tested 0.7 degrees apart. So for every one point you're testing on Humphrey, you're testing three points in this area. And we can easily see that that one probability point on the Humphrey is clearly a nice arcuate defect in the nasal field right near fixation. By the way, this patient was also complaining about vision loss, which is very, very rare in early glaucoma. And this field went right into fixation. So you could see that the defect that she had actually went into fixation. Although it's rare, the field that did explain why her vision was decreased. Moving on as glaucoma progresses, we begin to see notches and thinning of the rim and it's usually the superior and inferior rim tissue. There's a superior notch in this particular nerve and that's coinciding with affecting the longer axons and these axons stop at the horizontal raphe. So what we expect to get are nasal steps. And this is a little bit more widespread loss affecting the longer axons. And this is a typical nasal step type defect. It stops at the horizontal raphe. As glaucoma continues to progress, we have thinning, more extensive thinning in this case of the inferior rim and more of these axons are affected. As these axons are affected, we begin to get in moderate glaucoma, arcuate scotomas. And also these scotomas may become denser as more axons become involved and they often connect to the blind spot. As glaucoma continues to progress, more of these nasal axons are affected. And as the rim tissue continues to become excavated and thinned in advanced glaucoma, we now get altitudinal type defects, dense altitudinal loss, and this indicates that the patient has much more progressive disease. You can see these, these deviations are very, very high. And then in end-stage glaucoma, obviously the, the uh, nerve is completely cupped out, but I think you can appreciate there's a little bit of nasal rim remaining in some of our patients so that even though the field is constricted, we get some remaining temporal islands of field that, that uh, persist. And then finally, as the disease progresses, the papillomacula bundle is affected and the patient loses their vision. We don't want our patients to get to this end stage. So we're very, very concerned about diagnosing glaucoma early, but sometimes we jump the gun too quickly. So let's start out by going over some of the non-glaucomatous etiologies of paracentral field loss. And one of the diseases that we need to rule out are the hereditary macular diseases like Stargardt's macular degeneration and cone dystrophy. The field defects are superior paracentral. And why is that? Because these patients acquire a superior eccentric fixation. Now, this is a typical picture of a patient with Stargardt's disease. They have macular involvement, reduced vision, and very often they have these associated fundus flavi maculatus type flex. So you might say, well, I can tell from this picture that the patient has an abnormality in the macula. So therefore, if they have a paracentral defect, I'll know why if they are a glauma, glaucoma suspect. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Here's a patient where the retina looks completely normal. There may be a little bit of a disturbance here in the macula, but when you take a picture of this patient, a very important feature of some of our cameras is the fixation pointer. And if you simply ask the patient to look at the tip of the fixation pointer, you will see where their fixation is. Now here's a patient with 2040 visual acuity. It's not terrible, yet look where she's fixating. Why is she fixating here? Well, let's see what her visual field looks like. She has a superior nasal paracentral field defect. So you see that all these deviated points are significantly deviated, and you can see that the uh, probability of these defects is very significant. So it's very interesting that she comes with her father, and we looked at her father. Now her father has a much more extensive fundus, uh, much more extensive fundus abnormalities. He has a much larger macular defect and he has 
a lot of these fundus flavi type lesions, which by the way, are filled with a substance called lipofusin, which is part of this disease. His visual acuity is not 2040, he's 2400. So he clearly has Stargardt's disease, which enables us to, to diagnose her as well. Now this case preceded OCT and other types of imaging technology, but we were able to tell that she had Stargardt's disease and that's why she had her field defect. Notice the father also has a paracentral defect, but it's much more dense. And his is superior, much more nasal type of paracentral field defect. So again, these patients will have paracentral field loss. So if you have a patient who may not have been diagnosed with a macular dystrophy, an inherited macular dystrophy, who is a glaucoma suspect, let's say they have high eye pressures and you do a visual field and find on your central field that they have a paracentral field defect, look to see where they are fixating. Because what they do is they fixate superiorly and the lesion is inferior to fixation, which projects to a superior field loss. Another non-glaucomatous etiology of paracentral field loss. This patient was actually referred to us as a glaucoma suspect, a 24-year-old African-American male, a glaucoma suspect because he had large cup-to-disc ratios and elevated IOPs in the low 20s. So he already has three risk factors for glaucoma, his race, the large cupping, and elevated IOPs. So we take our disc photos and we see that he does have large discs. He does have a large degree of cupping that's actually pretty deep. You can see the lamina, but yet in the left eye, the rim tissue looks fairly healthy, although there's this vessel that's, that's, that's creeping up over the edge, it's bending up over the edge. It's a little bit of concern. And in this eye, uh, we are also uh, concerned a little bit about the thinning of that rim tissue. But overall, the nerve fiber layer does appear to be uh, thick when we look at the nerve and the nerve fiber layer. Again, this is without an OCT. So don't always depend, in, depend on an OCT, get in the habit of looking at the nerves. So we do a 30 degree visual field and the visual field is overall normal. We don't really see any losses here you know, this is the blind spot. We don't see anything of significance in this visual field. However, in a patient like this with elevated pressures, who's a glaucoma suspect, we want to do a central 10 degree visual field. Well, the left eye 10 degree field was normal, but the right eye visual field had this paracentral, very dense focal defect. So in this is a, again, the 10 degree field, the blind spot is over here. Here's, the, here's fixation, and you can appreciate on both the deviation uh, corrected comparisons, and you can see how high these deviations are, and on the deviation curve, you can see that most of his, his, uh, his, his uh, thresholds are within the expected, but there's just a few that are not only affected, but significantly affected, and goes all the way down to the baseline here. What could be causing this very, very dense focal paracentral defect. Well, you have to learn to explain your visual field defects. Uh, if you look at the nerve fiber layer, which we should be looking at in our eyes, in our patient's eyes, you see that the superior and inferior temporal nerve fiber layer do look fairly well preserved. But if you look over here in this region, along the papillomacula bundle, there is a deepening of the color. It looks a little bit more red compared to above and below where we don't normally see the nerve fiber layer so easily, but when there's nerve fiber layer dropout, we can relatively see that there is a difference. So there is this dropout, but what's causing this dropout? Well, some of you in the audience may know the answer already. You're very observant. You notice that this dropout is corresponding to this very, very dense field defect because there is no nerve fiber layer there. This is again without an OCT. If we had the OCT, obviously this would be thin. You don't need an OCT in this case to be able to see the nerve fiber layer thinning. And it's already very, very dense there. What's causing it? This patient has an optic pit and some of you may have seen it already but I will tell you that optic pits get missed all the time. 
we're quickly looking at the nerve. Sometimes they're very light in color and we don't always see them. They are incomplete colobomas and they are often associated with nerve fiber layer loss in the papillomacula bundle region. So look at the nerve carefully when you're trying to explain a paracentral visual field defect. Now here's a patient who was referred to us because the patient was being treated for glaucoma, but yet he had optic nerve pallor. And this is a 39 year old African-American male with a family history of quote, eye problems. He had a prior diagnosis of glaucoma based on optic nerve cupping and OCT RNFL thinning. Makes sense. I don't know what the pressures were. The patient came to us already being treated for glaucoma. He was taking a prostaglandin, prostaglandin analog before bedtime. However, he started complaining about decreasing vision over the past few years. And the vision wasn't that bad. It was 2025 OD and OS, yet he was noticing the vision was not what it used to be. And he's 39 years old. He was also complaining about increasing light sensitivity and trouble seeing reds and blues. So this is not typical of what you would see in glaucoma. These are his optic discs. I think you can appreciate, yes, he had large cups, uh, excavated cups, deep, but yet I think you can also appreciate that there is pallor uh, on the temporal border of both nerves. If you look at his OCTs, in the ganglion cell analysis, you could see that there's diffuse thinning, marked thinning in both eyes. And yet he had 20-25 visual acuity, but thinning of his ganglion cells in both eyes. If you look at the RNFL, the RNFL is also thinned, noted for thinning, infrotemporally in both eyes, both in the quadrant analysis and in the clock sector analysis. And you can also appreciate it in the, in the maps above here. So the OCT does look somewhat glaucomatous. His nerves look glaucomatous, if, except for the fact that he has temporal pallor. We don't see that typically in glaucoma. So let's look at the OCTs of his macula because he is complaining that his vision is decreasing. The macula itself looks pretty good, but I think you can appreciate that the RNFL, which normally you can appreciate on the OCT in this raster scan, you're not seeing much of an RNFL here in this eye or in the, in the right eye. Normally we expect to see a reflective thick layer there, not seeing it here. So let's look at the visual fields. In the visual field of the left eye, he has one probability point that is picked up by the MTOP. This might be missed by a 10-2 on a Humphrey, but it gets picked up here and a little bit over here. And then in the right eye, he has more paracentral field loss that is picked up on this MTOP. Again, because in the central four degrees, the points are 0.7 degrees apart. You get a lot of information in that central area. So if he does have excavation and he has that extensive optic nerve RNFL thinning, and ganglion cell thinning, you would expect that his visual field defects would be a lot worse. But he does have paracentral field loss. And why is that? Well, he was complaining about his color vision. So we looked at his uh, color vision testing and we did a test called the Raven Color Contrast Sensitivity Test. And this is a test where a patient looks at different letters in different colors and at different contrast levels. A normal patient will be able to see all the letters of all the colors at all the contrast levels, and their results will be uh, seen to extend up here into the normal zone. Patients with reduced color contrast and color vision, their results will be depicted down here. Here's the right eye and here's the left eye. Remember, he was complaining about not seeing reds and blues. So notice that his blue performance was really poor. His green performance was decreased and his red performance was decreased. And it, this sort of coincides with what he was complaining about, not so much about greens, but definitely blues and reds. So that makes sense with his complaint. Well, it didn't match uh, with the thinning and with the fields. So we decided to send him out for uh, genetic testing and it came back positive for a pathogenic variant on the OPA1 gene, 
which confirmed a diagnosis of dominant optic atrophy. This is a disease of childhood onset. It's inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. So if you ever suspect it and you, you can examine a family member, chances are 50% of family members have this. They don't always know they have a problem because the visual acuity can be very good when they're younger, but there is a slow progressive visual acuity loss. These patients deserve to know that they have this diagnosis. It's also uh, characterized by diffuse or temporal optic nerve head pallor. Pallor, here's the key word, with optic disc excavation and RNFLGC thinning, with generalized color vision defects and paracentral field loss. So the question is, does this patient need to be on his glaucoma medication? We advise the doctor who referred him that he does not have glaucoma. Well, he does not have, uh, he has dominant optic atrophy and we would leave it up to the referring doctor to decide whether or not to take him off of his medication and follow his pressures. Because again, we did not know what his original pressures were before he was medicated. But again, dominant optic atrophy, easy to miss. Now let's move on to non-glaucomatous etiologies of nasal field defects. We have here a, a lady who came to a vision screening and at our vision screenings, we take acuities, we measure pressures uh, and we do some other tests. She's 66 years old, asymptomatic, decided to come to the screening because she heard about it, hadn't had her eyes examined in a long time. And at the screening, they picked up, she had normal vision but they picked up that she had elevated IOPs. So they recommended that she come for a complete, that she go for a complete vision evaluation at a place of her choosing. Thankfully, she came to see us and we were able to dilate her pupils and take a look at her nerves. Uh, both eyes look the same. I'm just showing you an image of the right optic nerve in both color and in red free. I think you can all appreciate there are these extuberances that are sticking out of the optic discs in, in, in both pictures. And these are obviously a drusen of the optic nerve head. She's an older lady and in older patients, these drusen come to the surface and they are easy to see. The problem is that because the pressures were elevated, we of course proceeded to do a visual field and she has an infronasal step defect in the left eye and a supronasal defect in the right eye. We cannot see what her cup to discs ratio is or are because drusen, as a colleague once taught me, are like ice cubes filling up a glass. You cannot see the depth of the glass because of all the ice cubes that are in there. So you're not gonna be able to see what type of cupping she has and no device will be able to see either, quote C either because of the drusen. So we have to follow these patients other ways. And this field defect could be glaucomatous and it could, could just be due to the disc drusen. Because what are disc drusen? They are hyaline deposits in the optic nerve head. They are buried in younger patients causing blurred disc borders leading to what we call pseudo papilledema. But drusen are not benign. They interfere with axoplasmic transport and they cause optic neuropathy, just like glaucoma causes an optic neuropathy. And most often drusen are associated with inferior nasal and temporal field loss, but most often nasal field loss, just like glaucoma. So what do we do in this patient? Does she have glaucoma or does she have disc drusen? Keeping in mind that if you have visual field loss, your nerve fiber layer is going to be affected and that can be progressive, just like glaucoma can be progressive, optic nerve drusen also can cause progressive loss. So we cannot treat the drusen, but we can treat the elevated IOP. So it doesn't matter that we cannot assess the cup to disc ratio, we need to lower the IOP. So at least reduce one insult to the optic nerve head, lower the IOP. This is a, a disc photo of a patient. Now that we have fundus autofluorescence technology, we can follow patients with drusen a little bit better. Yes, we can also do B scan. You all, all learned that if you have calcified drusen, you can detect them that way. But some of us don't have B scans in our office, but many of us now with our camera systems do have the ability to do an imaging technology called fundus autofluorescence. And in very disc drusen, they will become more obvious. They will be 
I hyper auto fluorescent. For those of you who don't know about this imaging technology, it's just a matter of putting in a different filter in the camera. So you're looking at the topographic map of what's going on in the outer retina in terms of lipofusin and calcium also can, uh, can cause hyper autofluorescence that you see here. Very, very often when we're taking autofluorescent photos, we find dysdrusin just accidentally. So it's a great imaging technology. Nowadays, we can also use OCT of the optic disc to locate drusen. Here, it's a no-brainer. We see the drusen. And in the optic disc uh, section, we see that there are, the, uh, they are hypo-reflective uh, cavities from the drusen. But in these younger people, younger people, it's not so easy. If they have blurred disc borders, you want to do an OCT of the optic disc in addition to fundus autofluorescence. And you will appreciate also some cavities where these drusen are located, some hypo autofluorescent cavities and shadows from these drusen. Now let's move on to arcuate field defects. What are some of the non-glaucomatous etiologies of arcuate defects? By the way, I, in, in this course of this lecture, uh, I only have time to talk about certain types of diseases, but there are many, many uh, conditions that can cause glaucomatous type field defects. This was originally a two hour lecture but I'm going over some of the highlights. So let's start out with this case. A 43 year old African-American male presents reporting a darkness in his eye and an inferior shadow of three days onset. So he came to us within three days and notice inferior shadow. Your patients will more likely notice an inferior field defect than a superior field defect. Why? Because most of their days are spent looking at their phones, reading, it's quite obvious when they have an inferior field loss. With superior field loss, completely opposite. This gentleman had a history of recreational drug use. We did not find that out until after uh, we did our testing and we asked him, but it did not originally come out in the history. His left eye was normal. So because he came to us within three days, we were able to see in his right eye why he had a shadow. He had this whitening along the superior arcuate retina, this whitening. Now, had he come to us a week later, we would not have seen this whitening and we might not have known what happened to him. But what this means when we see this whitening is that he has, he has a problem with one of his arteries. And you do a visual field on this patient and you can appreciate in the deviations, the nice arcuate nature of this visual field defect, which you can see down here. All of these deviations are statistically significant. Why does he have it? Well, he has an occlusion of his cilioretinal artery. It's a type of artery occlusion. It's a small artery. And about 20% of the population has these arteries. They are missed all the time. They are arteries that don't come off of the central retinal artery, they come off the ophthalmic artery and they exit out of the temporal border of the disc. They usually travel directly to the macula. And if that happened in this patient, he would have noticed and suffered from permanent visual acuity loss. He is lucky that his cilioretinal artery deviated superiorly, so all he had was an inferior shadow. A recreational drug user, young people that do use recreational drugs, sometimes these drugs are made with talc particles, and this is a smaller artery. So the talc particles can get stuck and can cause a permanent, uh, can cause an obstruction. And if that obstruction is long enough, lasts long enough, it will cause permanent loss of the nerve fiber layer and the vision in this area or the visual field. So his visual field is dense and it's arcuate, and unfortunately, it's permanent. As I said before, you may not see the retinal whitening in an older occlusion. So then you might need to do an OCT in this area to look for thinning of the RNFL, which may occur a couple of months later, or many practitioners will refer the patient for fluorescein angiography. But in a glaucoma suspect, you might miss this. You might miss this, however, this dense defect will be stable. It will not progress over the years. And that's a difference with glaucomatous field loss, which will progress 
especially if it's not controlled. Let's now move to another case, a 58 year old male who presents for a routine eye exam. Chief complaint, I need new reading glasses. All of his prior eye exams, nobody ever told him there was anything wrong. Uh, and his best corrected acuity was 2020 in each eye. Everything was normal, his IOPs were normal. Now he had the good fortune or maybe the bad fortune, the way you wanna look at it, to see me that day. And when I was doing gross confrontation visual fields with my fingers, this very observant patient noticed that when I was testing his superior field, he said, you know, I see your fingers, but I don't see your fingertips. What patient ever told you that they don't see your fingertips in the superior and in, in, in field of both eyes? Right away, I knew he had a field defect, a dense field defect in both eyes, and probably an, a, an arcuate type defect in both eyes, and it was symmetric. So then I looked at his fundus. Now other people had looked at his fundus and remarked that he had these bilateral arcuate areas of, of where the retina appeared to be lighter of RPE hypoplasia. And there was some pigmentary abnormalities over here and some pigmentary abnormalities over here, but they didn't make anything of it. And because he was not a glaucoma suspect at the time, nobody had ever done a visual field. But uh, I ordered a fluorescein angiography because we did not have fundus autofluorescence at the time. And you can see these areas of, of, of RPE and retinal degeneration in both eyes in an arcuate fashion. And, and you can appreciate some staining around the edges where the retina is becoming thinner and the RPE is affected, sort of like window defects, if you will. If you do a visual field on this patient, you find that he has bilateral, dense, arcuate scotomas. Glaucoma does not do this. Now this patient was not a glaucoma suspect, but what if he was? And you did a visual field and you saw these dense arcuate scotomas. Would you think that they were, these were glaucomatous? Well, maybe you would, maybe you would not. A, they're very dense. Uh, B, they are very symmetric. And glaucoma doesn't do this. Glaucoma affects, it's an acquired disease. It affects the eyes in different, at different times. And it starts out with relative field loss, not absolute field loss. Look at these deviations, very absolute. And this is something the patient didn't notice because you do normally don't notice superior field loss. However, his nephew who has the same condition told me you know, now I know why when I go hiking, I'm always bumping into the branches in the trees above me because he really does have a superior field loss that he never really took seriously. As time goes on and we get other technologies, the same patient, you can appreciate there is an enlargement of these arcuate areas and a deepening of his field loss. And now we have fundus autofluorescence and fundus autofluorescence we can appreciate what's going on on his outer retina. First of all, he has these bilateral symmetric areas that are hypoautofluorescent because the RPE and photoreceptors are completely gone. However, centrally, he has a hyperautofluorescent ring, a hyperautofluorescent ring. What does this mean? This means that he has photoreceptors here. He has RPE here, but the cells are very stressed. And this shows up very typically in a photoreceptor disease. Now let's rotate his visual fields around and we can match this arcuate scotoma, this dense arcuate scotoma to his fundus autofluorescent images. So what does he have? Well, let's look at his niece. And you might say, well, it's obvious from the fundus autofluorescence, we can explain the fields. But let's look at his patient's niece. What if she was a glaucoma suspect? She was 33 years old, younger than him, younger than her uncle. And she discovered 10 years ago when she was a medical student, when they were learning about eyes, they learned about visual field testing. So they always did the tests on themselves and she had normal vision, she had no complaints. And they noted that she had a superior visual field defect and she never knew why, she never pursued it. She had normal vision, no complaints. She had other things to worry about as a medical student. But as you look at her fundus, you will see that this fundus looks pretty normal. She's very uh, pale skin. 
She has light colored eyes. She has a light colored blonde type fundus. She has light colored hair. Nothing unusual, not like her uncle. But if you look at her visual fields, you would not be able to explain that field defect based upon her retina. And you can see that she has an arcuate defect in this left eye and a sort of not, not quite yet arcuate defect in the right eye. If you do fluorescein angiography on her, <clears throat> which you wouldn't do in your office, but we were able to see <clears throat> that she has RPE thinning, window defects that are showing up worse in the left eye, which corresponds to her worst visual field in the, in, I'm sorry, in the left eye, and which corresponds to her worst uh, visual field in the left eye. So what do these, ha these patients have? They were sent out for genetic testing, which confirmed that they have an autosomal dominant type of retinitis pigmentosa. This man who was 58 years old never knew he had a disease till he came to see me. And he still comes to see me, even though I was the one who told him he had a disease. We got in his, all his family members and it is definitely autosomal dominant. Uh, it's a relatively mild mutation. <clears throat> so only a sector or a region of the retina is affected. So when you see dense, dense arcuate field defect, rule out photoreceptor involvement, use your fundus autofluorescence imaging. Now here's a case of a patient who has glaucoma and almost ended up with more surgery because they thought that her glaucoma was getting worse. A 67 year old African American female diagnosed with glaucoma based on just one visit, why? <clears throat> because at that visit, her IOPs were 28 in the right eye and 38 in the left eye. Because of those pressures, she had had a history likely of a non-ischemic central retinal vein occlusion in that left eye, which left her with a best corrected acuity of 2020 in the right eye, but only 2040 in the left eye. So by the time we had followed her, she had already had that resolved non-ischemic central retinal vein occlusion. She was on treatment and her IOPs were always maintained in the mid-teens with meds. Her cupping was 0.3 in the right eye, 0.4 in the left eye. So she had a little worse glaucoma in the left eye. However, over her follow-up visits, it was noted that her visual fields were getting worse. So she had an SLT in both eyes to get her pressures down, selective laser trabeculoplasty, and she had a trabeculectomy in the left eye to get her pressure down. Then they wanted to schedule her for a trabeculectomy in the right eye until someone sat down and said, wait a minute, these fields don't, these worsening fields don't make sense. So here are the disc photos of that patient, a 0.3 in the right eye and a 0.4, a little more vertical cupping in the left eye, clearly worse glaucoma in the left eye. These are her, uh, oh, this is the OCT of the RNFL. You can see in the thickness map and over here uh, on the quadrant analysis that <clears throat> she has superior thinning in the right eye and both superior and inferior thinning in the left eye. Remember she had an old central retinal vein occlusion in that eye and worse glaucoma. So now let's look at the visual fields and let's look at the RNFL map. She has very dense, very symmetric arcuate defects in both eyes she also has a small pericent a paracentral defect, presumably because she did have a central retinal vein occlusion in that eye. She may have had macular edema, we don't know. And that may have caused a paracentral field loss. However, look at the, look at the uh, dense arcuate field defects that she has. Once she also has glaucoma, so this could be a paracentral defect from her glaucoma. So the question I ask you is, do the visual fields match the RNFL thinning. If you look at this eye, there's superior thinning. We would expect an inferior arcuate defect. We have a superior arcuate defect. In this eye, we have both superior and inferior thinning. This inferior thinning might explain that defect, but what about the superior thinning? We don't really see a marked arcuate uh, defect in that eye. So what's going on here? Now let's look at the color photos beyond the optic discs. And I think in the color photo, you can appreciate there is some pigmentary abnormality over here, inferior to that disc. There's some over here. There's a spot over here. But when you're getting 
strange images on your fundus photos. If you can, you should definitely use fundus autofluorescence. These images are from an Optos camera, which has a very good way of doing fundus autofluorescence. They use very good filters. And this is what we see. So what does this patient have? Well, I think you can agree it's symmetric. I think you can agree it's arcuate. And I think you can agree there is hyper autofluorescence and some hypo autofluorescence where there is cell degeneration. What does this patient have? Well, let's do an ERG because fundus autofluorescence demonstrates abnormalities in the outer retina. So does this patient have any form of outer retinal disease that could affect the ERGs? And there are mild reductions in amplitude in the scotopic and photopic ERGs. The ERGs are not normal. The fundus autofluorescence is not normal. So do the visual fields, if we rotate them around, do they match the lesions? And I think you can agree, yeah, yeah, this is very dense. And this represents photoreceptor loss as well. What does this patient have? This patient has also sector retinitis pigmentosa, not worsening glaucoma. So we saved this patient from getting another trabeculectomy. Let's move on to non-glaucomatous etiologies of altitudinal field loss. This is a 24 year old African-American female who presents for a routine eye exam because she said she got glasses three months ago at an optical chain store. And for three months, she just doesn't like the way she sees out of her glasses. And she went back, they refracted her again, not getting any improvement. Doesn't like the way she sees. She had no other complaints, no headaches, nothing except she doesn't like the way she sees out of her glasses. Her health history was noted for only that, what she told us, that she has been gaining weight. She did not uh, reveal any other health problems, no diabetes, no high blood pressure, just gaining weight. These are our clinical findings. She didn't have 20-20 vision. She had 20-30 vision, both at distances and near, which is why she was complaining. She had normal anterior sex structures, her angles looked normal. She had normal pupils, but her IOPs were elevated. So while she was dilating, we performed a visual field because she was a glaucoma suspect. She had elevated pressures. She was African-American. So let's do a field, not waste time. And these are her visual fields. In her left eye, a very dense altitudinal field defect that's sort of spilling into the inferior field, but really, really dense and also diffuse loss elsewhere, but much densely noted in this right eye, superior nasal, almost like a step type defect, very dense in both eyes. So you say to yourself, okay, so she's a glaucoma suspect. She's got these visual, dense visual field losses. And I will never forget the day that I saw her, a retinal specialist happened to be there. And he just walked by my room for whatever reason, came in to say hello, looked at these fields and looked at the patient and said, whoa, advanced glaucoma, and then left the room. So, you know, this definitely was glaucomatous. And then we decided to look at her nerve fiber layer. Now, this is an older case, and I'm, I'm happy to bring this up because there's a device that some of you in the audience may remember, the old GDX nerve fiber layer analyzer. Now, this was one of the first devices that was able to measure the thickness of the nerve fiber layer. And it was very good at what it did. And it measured it by the principle of biorefringence of the RNFL. And it gave us the information that we needed. Look at the thickness map. You don't see any of the warm colors. This is the deviation map. All of these points are deviated with a high degree of statistical significance. She, all of these numbers, the averages, the superior and inferior averages, all in red. And the GDX had a, a measurement called the nerve fiber indicator. And the closer you got to 100, the more likely it is you had glaucoma. So if you look at her nerve fiber layer, this is down here, her T-SNIT curve. This is the normal, uh, the normal ranges for right eye and left eye in green and purple. And this is the patient's T-SNIT curve, significantly reduced. So she's got real extensive diffuse thinning of her RNFL. 
So then you see her RNFL is thin, her pressures are elevated, she's got dense glaucomatous field loss. Let's look at her optic nerves. We've got to look at the nerves. We've got to look at the cupping. We've got to look at the NFL. Although we know it's thin, we've got to look at the cupping. So now let's look at the cupping. And you're looking at these nerves and you're saying, I don't see the cupping. And you don't see the cupping because both of these discs are very swollen. And not only are they swollen, but if you're very observant, you will appreciate that she has these light colored striae over here that we call patents folds. She has an epipapillary membrane here, which has no significance, but both discs are very swollen. Now let's look at her. And you'll see that she's a young female and you'll see that she is standing with her legs far apart. She said to me, you know, I'm walking this way and I keep my legs far apart because I've been gaining weight. This is the only way that I can balance myself. So you look at her, she's a young female, she's overweight and she has papilledema. And you think to yourself, okay, she likely has idiopathic intracranial hypertension or what used to be known as pseudotumor cerebri. But we all know before we make that diagnosis, we have to make sure that she does not have real tumor cerebri. So she is sent out for uh, neuroimaging to a neurologist and she gets tested. And you can see from this photo, this is a CT scan. Uh, these are not the orbits. These are her third ventricles. And you can see that her third ventricles are huge. They are three times the normal size. And she has, there's her cerebrum. There's her cerebellum and her pons. You can see these are all the same color, but there's this large, huge to this huge tumor that is squashing the cerebellum the cerebellum should be over here it is getting squashed up pushed up into the pituitary and that's going to affect her visual fibers it's also going to affect her hormonal balance so we just said to her you know also during part of the examination um anything else you want to tell us how are your menstrual periods she said, well, I stopped menstruating six months ago. And I said, what did you do about it? She said, I went to the gynecologist who did a pregnancy test and told me I wasn't pregnant. And it ended there. It ended there. So this is why she was not menstruating more. What is this lesion? It was removed and it ended up being a cerebellar hemangioblastoma. Now, it turned out it was an isolated hemangioblastoma. Um, this is the most common type of CNS tumor seen in one of the phacomatoses, von Hippel-Lindau. She had no retinal angiomas. She had no other signs of von Hippel-Lindau. And uh, she, it was thought that this was just an isolated lesion. They checked her for over a year, thinking that it could have grown back, but it never did grow back. So she did not have IIH. She did not have pseudotumor cerebri. And she did not have glaucoma. Let's look at her four months later. Four months later, there is no more papilledema, but I think we can appreciate that now there's temporal atrophy because normally if you reduce compression within a normal period of time, a short period of time, everything, the nerve will come back to normal and the nerve fiber layer may come back to normal, but her nerve fiber layer was compressed her nerve was compressed for a very long time. That's why she had no nerve fiber layer remaining. And even at this visit, we repeated it. She still had no recovery of her nerve fiber layer. It was still extremely abnormal. And she has atrophy of both discs. Now, this were her visual fields. These were her fields before. And her visual fields recovered fairly nicely, which we don't see in glaucoma. Visual field defects will not recover in glaucoma. So uh, not like this. So anyway, this, she has a still a little bit of a residual defect over here and a very tiny one here. But overall, regardless, even though she had no more nerve fiber layer left or very thin nerve fiber layer, her visual fields recovered and her acuity improved to about 2025. 20, There's a lot of redundancy in the visual system. So this is her before. And I guess you'd like to see her now that her tumor was removed. And this is her now. So she looks a lot better. She's thinner. She lost all that weight. 
And look at how she's standing. Her knees are much closer together because of that undiagnosed tumor for all this time. She, she just thought she was walking funny because she was gaining weight. And the only thing that saved her was that she came to see us and she had papilledema. So she's smiling here. She's not smiling here. Why is she smiling? You might think because she lost weight and, and she got rid of this tumor. Well, she's like a whole new woman. She got a job, she got insurance. And once she got insurance, she was able to come and see me. So that's why she's happy. Now I'm sure she's happy for the other reason too. The tumor never came back. So here's a case of a 50 year old male who presents with a complaint of a shadow in his inferior field in the right eye for the past five days. Another, another inferior shadow. Again, people notice they will come with inferior field loss as a chief complaint. No pain, cutie was slightly reduced in the right eye compared to the left eye, but he had a positive APD in that right eye, which we don't typically see in glaucoma, unless it's really asymm asymmetric glaucoma and it's much, much worse in one eye. The IOPs were slightly elevated. His health history was noted for hyper high blood pressure. He was taking atenolol at bedtime and Hyzar twice a day during the day and at evening, but atenolol at bedtime. So when you look at his optic disc, you can see that his optic nerve head is swollen in that right eye. And not only is it swollen, but he's got all of these disc hemorrhages uh, that are uh, coming off the nerve. And obviously these are not Drance hemorrhages because you have a swollen nerve to go along with these hemorrhages, mostly in the superior portion of his nerve, although there was a little hemorrhage over here as well. And here is his visual field. I think you will notice on the grayscale in these dark colors, an altitudinal type defect, which you can easily see with these deviated points, significantly deviated in the inferior field. And on the probability, the corrected probabilities, and even on the probability plot, a dense altitudinal field loss. So what is causing this? Well, he was sent out for blood workup um, to make sure he didn't have any infectious or inflammatory diseases. Everything came back negative. So it was decided to just watch him. And at week two, you will see that some of these hemorrhages begin to resolve and you can now see more of the border of the disc. At week four, you can clearly see the disc is, is much more normal. It is a small, a small amount of cupping, a sort of a disc at risk that we call, call this. And it turned out that we followed him also with his visual fields. And what's interesting about him is that as his disc resolved, so did his visual field defect, which in this condition not, does not always occur. So you can see he's got an altitudinal field loss here, day one. Two weeks later, it starts to resolve and he's left with an inferior uh, nasal step. And then the field completely resolves. I looked at this and I said, you know, this looks like, like glaucomatous field loss, but in reverse. And the way that it recovered, the order in which it recovered was similar to the order in which it occurs in glaucoma but this is not glaucoma. This is a person who had a non-autoritic non anterior ischemic optic neuropathy attack or NAION. And he was very, very lucky that he had recovery of his visual field. It gave us an opportunity to appreciate how his field loss recovered opposite to the way glaucomatous field loss occurs. So in this condition, you have uh, you have a sudden onset of painless loss of vision and or in his case, visual field. It's usually unilateral, typically causes altitudinal field loss. You have this hyperemic swollen disc with peripapillary hemorrhages. These are some of the predisposing factors of which he had one, hypertension. And there's another factor, nocturnal hypotension. When you go to sleep, very often the, uh, your blood pressure goes down your perfusion pressure goes down. We already ruled out inflammatory infectious diseases with him with the blood workup. So in this case, we consulted with the patient's primary care physician to consider discontinuing use of the hypotensive medications before bedtime, because in this case, the patient had a disc at risk and it can cause nocturnal hypotension. 
So uh, this was reported by Hey Ray in 1994, and it is something that you need to consider uh, in a patient that develops NAION that has an arcuate or an altitudinal defect. Now, we don't have time to go over a lot of cases, any cases about peripheral field constriction, but these are some of the etiologies that you need to rule out in any glaucoma patient that may have these other concurrent conditions. Uh, with the inherited and acquired retinal degenerative diseases like retinitis pigmentosa and its related sister choroideremia, it's obviously going to be demonstrated on the, by the fundus that you have peripheral field constriction. Patients who've been treated with PRP diabetics, patients with ischemic CRVOs, they can also have peripheral field constriction. But what you may not know is you may have a glaucoma patient on valproic acid or vigabatrin. These are anti-epileptic drugs that can cause peripheral field constriction. In addition, psychotropic drug use, quinine and chloroquine have also been associated with peripheral field constriction. So make sure you know what drugs your glaucoma patients are on. Also, if you have a glaucoma patient who you think is worsening that also has recurrent attacks of optic neuritis, you need to know that those recurrent attacks can also cause peripheral field constriction. Uh, this is just an example of peripheral field constriction in a patient with retinitis pigmentosa on the right and advanced glaucoma in the left. I think you can appreciate that they do look different. In uh, RP, the field constricts equally on all sides and in glaucoma, uh, you're, you're left with the temporal islands that remain and the, and the rest of the field is constricted. So as the nasal rim tissue perseveres, you're gonna have some temporal islands and that's a clear difference between those, those two fields. So in summary, you wanna rule out these diseases in glaucoma suspects and in patients who you think may be having worsening glaucoma. The hereditary macular and optic nerve diseases congenital optic disc abnormalities, patients with branch retinal or cilia retinal artery occlusions. They have dense arcuate defects that do not change over time. Uh, compressive space occupying lesions can cause altitudinal defects uh, and among other glaucomatous type defects as well. Uh, ischemic optic neuropathies as we showed with that patient who was taking his blood pressure medication before bedtime and in patients with hereditary photoreceptor, retinal degenerative diseases, especially the sector or regional RP, uh, it's not obvious why they have that defect unless you do additional imaging like autofluorescent imaging. But we saw a case where the arcuate field loss was thought to be due to worsening glaucoma. So these cases are out there. People are not getting diagnosed properly, you're getting misdiagnosed, uh, sometimes treated where they don't need the treatment. So you need to be careful. And I wanna thank you for your attention in uh, listening to all of these interesting cases. And hopefully you will learn to look a little bit more closely at your glaucomatous fields and determine whether they are truly due to glaucoma. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Bass. So now we'll open up the Q&A section. Uh, greatly appreciate your lecture this evening, Dr. Bass. Um, the first question is, what is an MTOF? But I believe that they're referring to MTOP. Uh, would you like to explain what MTOP is? Sure, sure. Uh, it's an octopus type of field. M stands for macula. Uh, they also have G field, which is a, a 30 degree field that stands for glaucoma. But the top uh, represents their testing strategy, which is a very fast testing strategy. So M is a 10 degree visual field. The top is the fast testing strategy. Um, that's the test where you have the points very closely together in the central four degrees, 0.7 degrees apart. That field, the, the fast testing strategy actually only takes two and a half minutes per eye unless there's significant defects and it could take longer, but it's actually a very, very fast field. And we use it not only to look for paracentral field defects, but also in patients that have reduced acuity um, that, that can't be explained. So we'll, it's a functional test. And um, so it has a, a lot of uses in, in our clinic. Thank you for that answer, Dr. Bass. Um, again, I encourage everyone, if you have any questions, don't be shy. Feel free to put those in the Q&A. We're happy to answer those. 
Um, next question is for the young woman who had not IIH, given the high loss of RNFL, if she had an IOP and even the high normal range, would you try to get her to a low range of normal to protect her from normal RNFL loss over time? That's an excellent point. And thank you for bringing that up. Yes, so just like in that patient with the drusen, when you have one insult already and somebody has uh, elevated IOP, whether they have glaucoma or not is, is kind of moot. They still have an insult uh, of some sort to their nerve fiber layer and their nerve. So we can, we can lower pressure. We just use drops. Um, you know, we start usually with our prostaglandin analogs. It's a drop before bedtime. So yes, that, that young lady uh, would have been put on, uh, on medication. Yes, that would have been a good idea to do that. And that was something that we were considering at the time. Um, I've been following her over time and uh, she did not change. Her nerve fiber layer remained bottomed out. It wasn't, it didn't get any worse and her fields did not change. So at that particular point, we did not <clears throat> put her on any pressure lowering medication, but it's certainly something to think about in these patients. And it, it would, I don't think it would have hurt her any to do that. So very good point. Great. The next question is, was your patient with the improved field diagnosed in AION checked for Bartonella? I couldn't really tell from the photo, but he did not have a neuroretinitis. No, he did not have a neuroretinitis, but he did have a, a, a pretty extensive uh, workup for all the infectious and inflammatory diseases, which would have included Bartonella. Thank you. Uh, the next was just a comment again from um, Dr. Chauvelin, just stating that you had a great lecture with good messages. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> yeah. uh, the next uh, question here is, is the visual field defect, or I'm sorry, if the visual field defect is not due to glaucoma and the patient is using glaucoma drops, should they be discontinued? Okay, another great question. Um, with, with the patient that, that we had, that was referred to us with the optic nerve pallor, that patient was already being treated for glaucoma. So we didn't wanna make that decision. We left it up to the referring practitioner. You know, some patients, and I think we'll all agree, that, are be, that have been put on glaucoma drops who may not have glaucoma, and you tell them, well, you really don't need these drops, they're rather afraid to stop the drops because the drops are, are just drops. They're just eye drops, it's nothing really uh, that extensive for them to do or invasive for them to do. So they're a little bit uh, reticent to, to stop using the drops. Uh, so if it's a referred patient, I leave it up to the referring practitioner. But if it's one of my patients and who, who um, comes for a second opinion, then I might consider taking the patient off the drops and then watching the patient carefully, having the patient come back a month later to see if that pressure went back up again or if it uh, was maintained at an acceptable level. Uh, each case is different, but good Great. question. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is what features would best differentiate whether a glaucomatous type field defect is not due to glaucoma? Um, so yeah, there are some, some standard features, uh, some common features. I think a couple that I mentioned, first of all, if the field defect does not get worse over time, and it really looks exactly the same. Uh, secondly, if it's really, really dense, given the amount of cupping and nerve fiber layer loss, uh, you would know whether you should expect to have a relative field loss or a very dense field loss. And if the glaucoma is not that advanced, but you have very, very dense field loss, it might not be due to glaucoma. And also, as I mentioned before, with the two patients with the sectoral RP, if field defects are uh, not only dense, but very symmetric, Glaucoma doesn't do that. So it's a symmetry. You expect in glaucoma to have asymmetric field defects, not symmetric ones. Thank you. And I just want to mention, I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, presentation here that we were going to be running a little over this evening. So I thank all of you for hanging in there with us. Uh, right now, we just have one more question. So please, I encourage you, if you have any remaining questions, feel free to answer those. We're happy to stay on a little later and get those questions answered. Otherwise, after this last question, we will go ahead and thank you for your time this evening and uh, close out the program. So Dr. Bass, last question I have here so far, should patients with optic disc anomalies like Drusen and optic pit have baseline visual field testing? 
Absolutely, absolutely. Um, obviously, if the patient has very drusen and you are not aware that they have drusen, then you might not do a visual field. But if you, I mentioned that sometimes when we're doing fundus autofluorescent imaging, we actually find these drusen just by accident, these optic distrusion. And when you do find them, you absolutely should have a baseline visual field because they themselves can cause uh, usually nasal field defects. And optic pits, which also get missed a lot, if you do happen to see an optic pit, I think it's good practice to, to probably do um, a, a 10-2 or an MTOP if you have an octopus, but do a, a central 10 degree visual field if the patient has an optic pit as a baseline. Excellent. Dr. Bass, we don't have any further questions at this time. So I thank you for your time. Oh, we have thank one you. last one. Oh, just, one last one. <laughs> just to make the cut. People are hanging on. They're hanging it's on. Not, <laughs> it's not a question. It's just a, another compliment to you, Dr. Bass, uh, from Karen Fallis. So um, she oh my just gosh. <laughs> excellent lecture, and it was lovely to see you. So Karen thanks for Karen Fallis, that. okay. <laughs> College friend All of right. mine. Wow. Oh, thank that's, you. That's thank great. you, Karen. Dr. Bass, I thank you for your time this evening. I thank each of you for participating and joining us this evening. Do you have any final words for our uh, viewers? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for hanging in. I, you, all, you all hung on and that's the biggest compliment because nighttime lectures are the toughest to stay, stay on to, especially when they're, when they're running over time. And um, so I do thank you for that. <clears throat> this is a topic that really is, is near and dear to my heart because you know, I'm, we're still seeing these cases. Um, we have great imaging technologies, uh, but we just have to sit back and, and really, like I said before, look at the nerve, look at the nerve fiber layer, look at the field and just say to yourself, stop and think, does this make sense? So that's my, my, my parting comment. And, um, but I just love the referrals that we get because it, it, it helps me come up with some more great cases that I can share with, with, uh, with audiences like you. So thank you. Thank you for coming and thank you for staying. Appreciate it. <laughs> Fantastic. I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you again, Dr. Bass. Take care. Good night, everybody. Good night.